Mindful Happy Kids, created and narrated by Dr. Elizabeth Page, consists of interviews with children's authors and poets and illustrators, musicians of all types, and yoga and mindfulness practitioners. Dr. Page also reads from her own children's books on compassion, gratitude, mindfulness, and yoga. Pippi the Puppy and Dr. Page practice meditations or pet-centered meditations which are recorded as part of the videos. Hello, Rebecca Balcarcel. Hi, Welcome. great to be here. I'm yeah, so glad. this is exciting. I've really enjoyed your books and I'm really looking forward to exploring your whole process with you and your books with you and your characters with you. So would you like to take a couple moments to introduce yourself? Sure, yes. Uh, Rebecca Balcarcel, and I write middle grade novels, but I come from the world of poetry and um, my degree is in, in poetry. And I'm a professor at Tarrant County College, which is a community college in Texas, which I, I love. I love teaching. And um, I'm lucky enough to teach creative writing. So I try to share all my writing secrets with my students. Um, and I'll, I'll try to share a bunch of secrets today with you. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, teaching at a community college level is a gift, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit of a mission or a calling or something. Yeah, but a lot of folks are wanting a fresh start or needing some extra nurturing. And and I like that. I like the emphasis on teaching. Um, and, you know, I happen to also write, which is helpful to the students, too, because I can say, look, I, I'm writing, too. Like, you and I are both struggling as we we both have deadlines, <laughs> we both have revisions, and I hope that helps them feel less afraid of the writing process, you know, because I can say, oh, I'm tearing my hair out right alongside you. Oh, that's great. So you want to walk me through your writing journey? Ooh, okay. Let's see. I would say... Um, I'll give you a scene from sort of the beginning, the middle, the end. <laughs> um, when I was in seventh grade, uh, a teacher assigned a short story and I, I loved writing. I sat on the couch and I just became lost in the world of the story. And this little movie was playing in my head and I was writing down what was happening. And I thought, I want to do this, you know, and I didn't think about for money or whatever, but just, I want to have a creative life. You know, I want to have this experience. Now, fast forward to about college. I was not taking myself seriously as a writer at all. I was on a different path for a degree and, and profession. And um, I took a creative writing class for just for fun. And that class changed my life. And that teacher changed my life. And I now teach in the same classroom where that class was. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I can tell my students, hey, um, I was you. I really literally was in this same room. And um, what that semester was, mostly I just needed the opportunity to explore what it felt like to, to get back in touch with my creative self. And, you know, an author came to campus and that was a revelation. I thought, oh, that's a thing. You could actually be that. I guess all the authors I had read were dead or something. <laughs> I don't know. I just didn't quite grasp that being a poet or being an author um, could be a way of living in the world, you know. So um, from there, I started to pursue, you know, more. I started to write more regularly. I submit my work for publication. And for quite a long time, you know, 10 years or more, I was just focusing on poetry because I loved imagery and figurative language. And um, so when I went to graduate school, it was in poetry and I pursued the MFA in poetry. And I never really expected to hop out of that world until I wrote a stack of poems that all were in the same voice of one girl a 12 year old who turned out to be named Kihana. And 
I sent it to an agent and the agent said, well, you know, poetry. Uh, and I had published one book of poem before poetry before with a tiny press. And so I thought, I know what that's like. And, and the agent said, you know, if you want to do that again, great, you'll probably find someone. But if you want this to reach a very wide audience, change it into a novel. And I thought, but I don't know how to write a novel. <laughs> and she said, yeah, but you already wrote a novel. You just need to, you know, flesh it out and change. Well, it took a year or more to do that, but I finally did. Um, I sent her a version that was something like 25,000 words. <laughs> and the book that came from that is The Other Half of Happy. And it's something like 60,000 words. So it really fleshed out. And so from then I, you know, I wanted to write more books for middle graders once I learned what that was. And I love the middle grade audience. And I think of that time of my own life as being really pivotal and like a moment of awakening in so many ways. So, um, so now I've been writing middle grade novels and that's, and here I am. So you write a lot about Guatemalan culture. I do. Do you want to talk yeah. about why that's so important in your own life and in the work that you do? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so my dad was born in Guatemala and my mom went into the Peace Corps, which is the two-year volunteer program, and, and she was sent there and they met. She didn't speak a lot of Spanish yet. He didn't speak a lot of English yet, but you know, love finds a way, right? <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Across the two years, they dated and, and did learn each other's languages pretty well. And um, and they thought they might get married and, and stay in Guatemala. And then I would have been born there, I guess. But um, ultimately, they decided to go back to my mom's family home and, and be there and, and marry. And my poor dad had to like walk off the plane from having been on the equator to being in a snowstorm in November in Iowa and it was <laughs> quite a culture shock. And he, you know, he collected stories over the years too of how how hard it was for him to, you know, drop into the Midwest. At that time, he was one of like two Spanish speakers in the whole town. Um, but he loved my mom, he loved her family and, and they embraced him. And, um, but when I was born into that, little um like college town in north iowa i didn't encounter a lot of guatemalan culture or even any just any one speaking spanish or making tamales at new year's or anything and uh, the only person who t spoke spanish was the professor at the college who taught spanish and he was uh cuban and so I would, my parents would play Scrabble in Spanish and I was like, ah, so this is Spanish. Okay. <laughs> but then we moved to Texas uh, and I was about 10 and I realized, oh, okay. Uh, so suddenly we met lots of people who spoke Spanish, who made the food, who my dad was overjoyed. Like there was a Spanish radio station and television station. There was a soccer team, football team. And, um, you know, we, we weren't able to afford to visit. Guatemala much. So I only went a couple times in my life. Um, now I've, I've been kind of recently and I really love it, but, um, but it is important to include that in my work because for a long time, it was a part of me that was kind of hidden or even repressed because, um, you know, when you're about 10, 11, 12, even as I was discovering all of this color and beauty and music of, of, you know, Latina life. I was also trying really hard to be a normal American kid. And I think a lot of kids just want to be, you know, not different, but just kind of fit in. And so it took me a while. Um, I never would have worn something like this to school, for example. No, t-shirt, jeans, that's it. <laughs> you know, that's the uniform. So, um, I the noticed journey... that it's real pretty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but the journey that my characters take of, um, you know, connecting with their heritage and, and appreciating their heritage more deeply is the same journey that I had to take in real life of, um, 
you know, not worrying about being uh, like fitting into some sort of Anglo normal, but rather, yeah, embracing all the richness of my father's country. Um, and I'm still working on that. You know, I'm still experimenting with recipes or <laughs> um, trying to find the kind of hot chocolate that you melt in the pan instead of the powder, you know, and just, um, yeah, enjoying the music. And my dad played the guitar. And so I'm learning guitar now. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it, you're just richer if you can add and and I I learned that finally. So it was important for you to speak to kids in the Guatemalan culture or the Latino it, culture. It is, um, you know, a lot of the schools I visit will have a, a significant population of either immigrants from Mexico or parents are from Mexico or Central America, of course, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Um, in Texas, we don't get so many from Puerto Rico, can you know, Cuba, but um, I feel like those kids are kind of on the front row of my audience. Um, Cause of course I want to talk to all kids, you know, and, and speak to those universals. Um, but uh, it was so exciting for me when I first read a book with a brown character and it was House on Mango Street. And I'm not unique in that. <laughs> Almost so many of us first encountered that book by Sandra Cisneros and that changed our lives. And it, it did me. I thought, wait, my, before that, all my characters were white. I mean, I don't know. That's just like what you do. I, I it didn't occur to me, you know. Um, but when I read her work, I realized, wait, I could write my own life into a book, my own heritage and my mixed heritage. And that was a revelation. And so now when I meet kids who are also mixed or they're just plain, you know, Latino, um, I feel such a kinship immediately, like, you know, that we have something in common. I just met um, yesterday a youngster from Brazil, and he speaks Portuguese, Spanish, and and English. And he has just read my books, and um, he said, "I've never read a book about a kid so much like me," because he, you know, came from Brazil and was trying to live in two cultures. So yeah, I it's really important to me to speak to those kids in particular and say you matter and your experience is, is a rich one. It's nothing to be ashamed of at all, but quite the opposite, you know, by being bilingual, that's a superpower. Don't, don't be ashamed of your Spanish. Don't hide it. Um, of course, you know, the generation before kids now were sometimes punished for speaking Spanish at school, for example, like, Oh, what, you know, I think we can all agree that that was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I want my work to um, in particular, you know, reach out to those, those kids, but also beyond, because um, as people have said very often, books are like windows or doorways into other worlds that aren't yours. And so I hope my books are, you know, a, a passageway for kids of all kinds, boys, girls, and, you know, whatever color and ethnicity to, to enjoy the adventures of, of this character. Are your books being banned anywhere? They're not. And I think because a lot of the book banners don't read the books. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I can find bannable, possibly bannable topics and content in some of the books. Although I, I guess my, my books are also very wholesome in their, in their tone and all of that. Maybe it kind of, I don't know. So, so far, no, no, I have not heard of them being banned or challenged. Um, but so many of my author friends do have books that have come up on these lists. And it's it's been tragic because now kids, you know, don't have access to books that are could really um, 
impact them, even save lives. And I'm not exaggerating, but when you see a character in a book who struggles with what you struggle with, it just, it makes you feel like you're not alone in this world to, and you. Well, you do you have, might... I mean, other than having um, Latino kids, you you have gay kids in your book. I do. I have a gay best friend in, in one and I have, you know, a direct immigrant, not just not just born here, but an actual immigrant who's worried about the immigration laws and people um, in the other book. So, um, yeah, I think they're not on the radar for some reason. And we'll just kind of... We'll try not to put them on the radar. <laughs> stealth. <laughs> <laughs> stealth book about brown kids. Would you like to give me the premise of The Other Side of Happy and Shine on Louise Vin Yeah, sure. Um, so The Other Half of Happy, the main character is Kihana, who's 12. And um, like me, she's half and half. Her father's Guatemalan, her mother's Anglo. And suddenly her family has decided to kind of like go all out Latino on her. And it's because of relatives moving to town and so on. But the worst thing in the world is happening. They want to take her to Guatemala for a visit. And she just feels like she's going to hate this trip. She's very um, insecure about her Spanish. And, you know, she thinks she will just not understand anything that's going on. So she spends the whole book trying not to go. <laughs> and, of course, um, when I mentioned about myself – kind of rejecting and repressing my heritage. That's her journey. She's she's trying to um, kind of ignore that half of her and hence the title. So um, she makes a new friend. She She's a great big sister. Really, she makes two new friends um, who help her, you know, grow and so on. Um, and she's a great big sister to her probably autistic little brother, um, and she's, yeah, she's on a mission to not go to Guatemala, but you know how that goes <laughs> when a character is really gung-ho against something, probably that's the lesson they need to learn. So um, by the end, she's realizing how valuable that heritage is. Yeah. Why did and, you have the autistic little brother? Well, I have sons who are on the spectrum. So I have identical twins uh, who are both diagnosed with autism and the the you know the special joys special challenges of that were they loom large in my mind as a mom so I thought yeah I, I felt like I could maybe write a, a character like them and also do justice to that um you know brain difference I feel like uh, it's tricky to write a character who is autistic, for example, if you're not autistic and you, you know, so there's a certain, um, I took that responsibility seriously, trying to make it authentic, but I was able to take a lot of cute moments with my own kids and put them onto that character. <laughs> so, yeah. He was a lovely kid. Oh, he's a he sweetie. He really was a lovely kid. Yeah, no, he really was a lovely kid. And yeah. the relationship between the protagonist and the younger son mm -hmm. were very um, was very tender, uh, and I, he was she was really his voice in a lot of ways. That's true, because that's that is one of the things that he doesn't talk yet, and people are wondering why why isn't he talking and. Um, they get his hearing checked and they, and these are things that happened in our lives. You know, we went for, uh, to the audiologist and tried nutrition things and all kinds of things to um, solve this puzzle. Um, and, and I feel like Kihana and, and little Mimito do really reflect my relationship with my sons. She's fairly maternal. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad she comes across as sweet and he does too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that there's a misnomer that people have about people on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I um, did a little bit of work with service dogs and people on the spectrum, did a little bit of research. 
and you just have to meet a couple of people and you're, you know, it's, it's not as scary as people think it is. Yeah, I, you know, you have TV portrayals and movie portrayals and, um, I, you know, the truth is that each kid is different or, and as they grow into adults, you know, they're, they're all very different and it isn't scary. They, I also find that they have very deep emotional lives and a lot of the stereotype is that, oh, they don't feel anything. It It's much more, at least in our family, it's much more that it's hard to tell It doesn't show it instantly on their faces. But I know from, you know, babyhood that they had very, uh, you know, active emotional lives. And um, they it's true they come across as a little bit stiffer or, you know, less socially fluid. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not feeling things and thinking and responding and, and even maybe extra sensitive. Uh, far from being like unplugged, um, sometimes they're especially affected by the environment, by noise, by light, you know, loud noises. So, um, yeah, but then everyone's different. So um, even my twins are different, even though their DNA is the same. They, you know, obviously they're different people. <laughs> yeah. And then the other side of happy, the grandmother was real important also. She was, and she, or she is, she's based a lot on my own grandmother. Um, my mom's mom was such a, such an interesting lady. She was like a basketball star and a PE teacher. And she went to college in an era when women didn't really go to college. Um, and then she raised these five children and, um, you know, it was, uh, she was a real inspiration to me. And particularly quite a, a rock in terms of wisdom. And you could just, one time I was in big trouble and I called her and she came and picked me up and just made it all better. And that's, yeah, Grandma Miller is actually named after my grandmother's family. So her, my grandmother's maiden name is Miller. And uh, so I pulled that name in to, to show how, um, that there's a connection there, you know, just to remind me as I was writing, like, yes. Yeah. And I loved creating a grandmother who's, um, you know, active. She's a scientist. She's um, on Skype. <laughs> you know, it used to be Skype more than other video calls. But <laughs> anyway, she knows how to video call. She knows how to stay in touch with her granddaughter and, um, you know, is a kind of a safe haven for for the main character there's Kiana can always go to grandma Miller for the, the perfect uh, pep talk or, and not just total positivity. I mean, also some challenging things. She says, you know, Kiana, you might think about this um, helping Kiana to really grow and face some things too. Yeah. yeah so Kiana, you need to uh, cope and deal. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's not going to go your way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone might not like you. Exactly. Yeah. Be be someone who's uh, so interesting that people want to know you, but don't try to change yourself to fit some idea of what they want or what you think they want you to be. Yeah. She's really good talking about boys because she's, <laughs> she's quite strong about that, that, hey, don't sit around waiting for that boy to call you or whatever you you're just be living your life be you know interesting and they'll notice they'll they'll want to be a part of you if unless and if they don't well you know maybe they're, they're missing out it's okay <laughs> or maybe they're gay yeah or maybe they're gay exactly <laughs> which is yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah that didn't occur to her as a possibility for a while and then it starts to kind of think yeah that that could be a reason too and I have to say the, the book is dedicated to my real gay best friend Daryl Dalton and he was my seventh grade best buddy and crush and um, so there's a lot of autobiography in this book I, maybe everybody's first novel is pretty you know, grows out of very close to your life experience. Um, but I dedicated the book to him because um, 
you know, he and I stayed friends all the way through adulthood. And so he could remind me, do you remember when we did this in seventh grade and when we did that and we had to substitute teacher and this happened? And he really kept that whole part of my life alive and the memories vivid for me. Um, and then he, he did die of cancer just before the book came out, but, um, he had read the draft and he approved of the character that is based on him. Jaden in the book. Yeah. 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 But this book stands as a bit of a tribute to him. So, you know, he lives on a bit in that character. Also, I inherited his cat. So I still have this little Zoe. (laughs) And um, so I think about him all the time. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And what about Oops. Shine On Luis Feliz? Yeah. So um, her name is Luz and it means light. And so um, she does shine. <laughs> it's a bit of a pun in the title. And, um, and her last name is actually my other like grandmother's maiden name. And so my family pronounces it Velis. But um, Anyway, it's uh, kind of a tribute to to that side of the family. And indeed, the book is more connected to Guatemala. So, um, so yeah, uh, Luz is, uh, she was a star soccer player, but she gets injured and we meet her, page one, uh, realizing that she's just never going to play again. Or if she plays, she won't be a star like she was. And we meet her when she's just throwing away all her trophies and her posters. And she's just like, I, I need to be someone else. And she stumbles on a computer class, really a robotics club. And so she starts learning about robotics and computer programming. And she meets a kind of a grandfatherly figure across the street who is, um, I, he used to work at Texas Instruments in the book, which you know, it's kind of like Apple now or Google or something. And his garage is like a ah, like a wonderland of old computers and science stuff and tools. And that's where she realizes she can learn a lot and bloom and, and really become someone besides just a soccer player. She's uh, she's nervous that that if she doesn't achieve at something um, that that she won't be valuable. She's a little bit confused, I think, about that love is conditional on her being a star. And it takes her a while to realize, wait, just being you is enough. You know, you're enough just the way you are. Um, And she partly learns that because of a huge change that comes into her life about halfway through the book. Her dad discovers that he has a daughter in Guatemala, born in Guatemala, uh, from the days before Luce's parents were together. And um, the mother has has died and and uh, is moving in. And so now Kihana's, I'm sorry, <laughs> Luce is going to have to deal with Guatemala, not, not just at a distance, but actually in her home, in her bedroom, <laughs> sharing her drawers and her closet. Uh, she's not happy, not at all. But the sisters, you know, they they start to grow together. And, you know, finally Luce realizes that both her sister and she, there's there's enough love to go around. And and she's both of them are valuable people with or without achievements and prizes and and being a star. So I also think it's kind of cool that they have difficulty communicating because they speak different yes. languages, but computer language they both understand. <laughs> Yes, I thought I that love was that neat. Too. I was lucky. I kind of stumbled on that as I realized um, that they, you know, I thought, well, maybe folks think that in Guatemala they don't have computers or something, but that's not true. Guatemala is a full modern country. You know, of course, there are villages where it's more of the traditional old ways and so on, but the city, you know, looks like. Dallas or whatever, you know. Um, so I thought, you know, maybe Lewis isn't the only one who is learning to code or knows a little something about computers. And so then that led to the girls being able to 
code together a little bit and to understand each other that way first. Because of course, um, the sister is just dropped in the United States and starting from scratch with English. And she's, you know, an ESL student or ESOL. And for a while, they they have a definite communication problem. Google Translate helps them a bit, but it's really the programming language that turns out to be a shared language. Yeah. And a shared love. And a shared love. Yes. Yes. I liked, well, I'm kind of a geek. So oh. I really liked the switch from soccer to robotics. Ah. I thought that was a really cool, you know, to make robotics cool was a really neat thing to do. Yeah. And, you know, seeing a, a girl in STEM, I, I was excited about that too. Um, we don't have enough of them, you, you know, adult women are not well represented in the coding world. Um, in other sciences, it's a lot more equal men and women, but I thought, you know what, um, this could be, you know, Luz can show girls that this is totally an open door for you if you're interested. Yeah. And especially Latina kids, because um, I feel like our culture doesn't always encourage girls as much as our young men, especially to go into these kinds of fields, um, you know, to get an education at all, and then much less science or math or computers. So, um, so I'm excited that, yeah, I wanted Luce to be special in that way. And I guess I'm a bit of a geek too. I was married to a computer programmer for 15 years and I loved that aspect of um, like seeing that, that aspect of his life and um, the, the way like coding late into the night, cause it was just so exciting. And it reminded me of my own creative process of writing. And I could see that the patterns of programs and the patterns of something like poems were really not that different. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just started thinking kind of, cross uh discipline <laughs> there and um yeah so i felt like it'd be fun to write about coding and robotics and i also watched a lot of youtube about mindstorm robots which is pretty much what i based it all on um, lego mindstorm robots uh, so yeah i know way more about that than i ever thought i would <laughs> and scratch you know is the coding language she uses and a lot of kids are familiar with Scratch, I've discovered in my school visits and everything, which is great. And I learned a little bit of Scratch. And on my website, you can actually click and see the game that Loose creates and see the code. And it's it's basically a hangman style game. Uh, but she um, is better at coding than I am. So I had to ask my son <laughs> to help me out with the actual finishing the code. It was a little bit of a reach for me, um, but uh, but the code is there. You you can actually see it and uh, and play the game. That's so, cool. Yeah, you dealt with some heavy topics. You had cancer. You had Parkinson's. You had. Yeah. We spoke about autism already. Um, there was some death and dying. Yeah, I think it's important to be honest with kids about you know life like the book is a reflection of the beauty and the tragedy of the world and kids can handle it I know um sometimes we want to hide things from them shield them but um at, at least by middle grade I I really have a lot of respect for my readers. So I felt like if I did it the right way, I mean, obviously it's not going to be graphic or something, but that um, real kids have to experience these things. And so, you know, book kids can experience these things and readers can can read about it. Um, so yeah, cancer is a tough one. Um, and my own grandmother, my mom's mom, um, I'm sorry, my mom's dad actually died of a a brain tumor and um 
you know, cancer has reared its head in the lives of other people I know. And I felt like, well, um, our, my character will grow with this experience the same way that I have had to grow losing someone. It makes you ask really deep questions, you know? And um, I think young people are ready for the deep questions. They really want to know, um, or at least not so much that adults have to have all the answers, but adults have to be honest and, and you know, let them ask the questions, let them explore the answers, you know, like life, is it, what is it for? Death, what is it for? Suffering, why do we suffer? Um, you know, these are these are not easy to answer. Maybe we never answer them. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, autism, Parkinson's, my dad had Parkinson's. Um, and, and his sister also. So I've seen that a lot. And, um, I read one review on, uh, uh, like a, just a reader on Goodreads saying, oh, I wish that hadn't happened to this character because she loved this character so much. And, um, you know, like, oh, I could have done without that. <laughs> it was a downer or something, which I, you know, every reader has their own experience. But, um, you know, Parkinson's is part of my life and kids are going to encounter it too. Let's, let's have it out there. You know, let's, let's just um, have a full picture of life and not try to sanitize it. Uh, old people do, you know, their bodies don't last forever. My body won't let, none of us leave earth any other way. <laughs> as far as I know, um, you know, except temporarily, right? So, um, yeah, I think we owe it to kids to ask the big questions within the book and in the story and, and model, you know, one way to, to handle it. Um, Kihana certainly grieves. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's some struggle around the autism. The Parkinson's is a little less central, but, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's part of life. And I want my books to be rich with all of the, you know, all the joy and all the suffering. They ring real authentic. Oh, thank you. Just And it is, it is both the joy and the suffering. And I think they say in, um, in Buddhism, without the joy, you don't have suffering. Without the suffering, you don't have joy. Yeah. Yeah. You really appreciate things in contrast you know to the other yeah i agree can you talk about um can you talk about the importance of sibling relationships in both of the books oh sure you know i might have given them siblings because i don't have one <laughs> at <laughs> least i didn't grow up with one um so um for Kihana and her little brother, Mimito, the one with autism, um, I really was channeling my own kids and, and all of that. But I felt like Kihana needed a little brother, too, that siblings really offer something special. Um, it lets you, at least Kihana ha has a whole side of herself that she can, she can be playful with her little brother. She can be kind of... Um, the one who knows stuff and uh, you know in other contexts she's feels at a disadvantage or she feels a lot like she's at a new school and she's like i don't even know where my classes are but with her little brother she's she's the one who knows something and she can be on the giving side and that's good for her she you know she she gets to develop herself more by being a big sister um and i feel like the, the just as an author, like if I create a sibling for a character, we've got more happening in the family, more dramatic potential and possibilities. Um, and yeah, letting the character kind of have multiple sides to themselves. A sibling is a good way to make that happen. Um, and then of course in Shine on Luz Feliz, uh, Luz, you know, the sister drops in on her from Guatemala all of a sudden. And this actually is based a bit in real life. I So I said I don't have a sibling, but 
actually, when I was in my 30s, or yeah, my dad revealed, or he found out, he didn't even know either, that he does have a daughter in Guatemala who was about five years older than I am. And um, this was a, a bombshell for him, for my mom, for me. But it turned out beautifully. We're very lucky that uh, she is an amazing, lovely person. <laughs> and she is, um, her, her name's Asusena. And Asusena was clear with my dad that she just wanted to know him. You know, she didn't need to yell at him or, I mean, maybe, maybe the in private, she <laughs> had something, some anger, you know, left over, I can imagine. But she just wanted to know who is her father. And she tracked him down after a lot of searching and, um, you know, looking in phone books and tracking down relatives and grilling her mother for details, trying to find out who this person was. And the fact that he had gone to the United States made it harder to to find him. But um, she did. She found him. And it was a happy ending because he was truly uh, amazed that she was in this world and, you know, got to know her. So I thought, I have to write about this. <laughs> you know, I have to bring this into a book somehow. And so I started imagining, like, what if we had met? What if we had known each other as kids? You know, what if somehow we had grown up together? And um, and again, I felt like the sister, whose name is Solana, when she comes into Luz's life, she really gives Luz a, a lot to, uh, to think about, a lot of challenges. She, you know, she's prettier. She's speak Spanish. She understands the dad's jokes in Spanish. She's a real big threat to lose, but she stands almost as a model of, of how to gracefully manage change. I mean, poor Solana, she's had, she has all the hardship. She had to move. She had to immigrate. She's lost her mother. Um, she's worried about the, the immigration implications and whether, you know, there's some loophole that might get her taken away again or something. So um, Solana has all the trouble really. And she is very poised and mature and, and Luz is kind of being a bit bratty. And so Luz realizes, Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I may never be as perfect as she is, but at least, you know, I can, I can mature a bit. I can learn to appreciate her. I can, get closer to my uh, heritage through Solana. And um, yeah, she is forced to um, grow a lot because of the sibling in this case. And she goes from being the only child to being the younger, which is, I think, hard. Uh, that an older kid is in the house is sort of backwards from what usually happens, you know, when a baby comes along. So um, she feels demoted. <laughs> You know, but it forces her to grow. So, um, yeah, the siblings really add a lot to this, these characters' lives. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Anything else that you want to say about these two books? I think we've we've said a lot about. I feel good about them. Yeah. So let's get to some fun. Would you like to read some poems from? Palabras in each fist. Did I say that right? Uh, you did, and I would. Yeah. It is. So um maybe the very now, first. This is a poetry book you written when you wrote when. Yes, let's see. It came out in 2010, like January of 2010. So uh nine years before the other half of Happy, my first novel. Um so yeah, I was <laughs> Just, let's see, I had finished a master's degree and I was kind of, you write a thesis, you know, for that. You write a book of poems that's kind of a work in progress. And so I took that work in progress and a, it took a few years. I want to say, you know, five, six, seven years before I had a stack of poems that I was really proud of. And then I started reading these things around at little conferences and open mics and so on. And uh, I was reading at a conference for creative writing teachers. And this man ran up to me afterwards and said, have you published that? 
And I said, no, <laughs> do you have a manuscript, you know? And yeah, right here. <laughs> Cause I was such a geek. I was carrying it around all the time. <laughs> and he said, well, let me look at it. And it took him like a year to, to say, yes, we would like to publish it. And this is um, a little press at St. Mary's university in San Antonio it was called Pecan Grove Press. Now this wonderful man has since died. And so the press has kind of disappeared, but, um, but he gave me, you know, this break. And so um, I have him to thank for that. And uh, yeah. So my first book was, was poetry. Yeah. Well, I'll read Guatemala, the first, the first poem in the book, it opens the book. Um and in a way, you know, my novel, The Other Half of Happy, is this poem writ large. Like, this is sort of the germ of that book, I think. So, okay. Guatemala. Guatemala was a place inside my closet. A crumpled tissue paper flower six inches across. It was a stack of workbooks that read Un Pajaro, Dos Gatos. Bought too late or worked too fast so that none of those dancing syllables would pair up in my head. Guatemala was wire hangers, wearing ruts in the shoulders of vestidos, dresses, inappropriate for all occasions in Northwest Iowa. Each skirt zigzagged with pink guacamayas. Crazy green quetzales shouted at me from each short sleeve, teasing me, my navy blues and forests catcalling, like the Hispanic boys hanging out against the Dairy Queen, boys with butterscotch skin, shouting roller coaster words, looping their exotic syllables up a scale, flicking cartwheel sounds, leaving me excited and sick, amazed to be noticed and wanting to hide, which I could almost do in my turtleneck and walking shorts, my knee socks and penny loafers, if only I didn't show my eyes, which were obviously chocolate, obviously giddy and frightened, certainly curious and filling fast with wonder at what I might let myself be and do with the disreputable Hispano boy. I looked straight ahead, kept walking, and these Dairy Queen boys I stuffed to the back of my closet with the crumpled flower, the taunting dresses, with the workbooks of the lilting language of my father's country, Guatemala. That's beautiful. Thank you. Do you have any other that you'd like to read? Well, sure. Um, I, I love your poetry. Oh, your poetry. It took you. me. It took me years to appreciate poetry. And now I've been reading um, novels in verse 10 ah. There's been a whole bunch of novels that have come out in verse. So I've interviewed a couple of people who wrote novels in verse. I've been reading their work. And now I'm just like, oh, wow, poetry can uh, be really beautiful. Uh, I I need to do that. I want to write a novel in verse. And I feel like the, the novels in verse have been wonderful to help people be less afraid of poetry, less intimidated by poetry. I think sometimes the way it's taught in school maybe makes us feel like it's impenetrable or it's meant to be hard and really poets I think are trying to reach your heart your soul you know trying to make a deep connection um and I think if we start with contemporary poetry like in my teaching I try to start with living poets you know and then work backwards we can get to Shakespeare but you know <laughs> week 10 12 let's start with Mary Oliver or Billy Collins or, you know, some contemporary folks who are writing amazing things. Um, and then, yeah, verse novels are, are, are fantastic. So I'm enjoying those too. Yeah. Well, I'll read Crepe Myrtles. I really like, it's just a personal favorite. Um, in Texas, we have these flowering trees, Crepe Myrtles. They're bushes and trees, depends what kind you buy. Uh, and the flowers are very crinkly on the edges. And so I, I describe that here in this, in this poem. Great myrtles. Those in full sun have cracked open their round cases and flounced out their ruffles, hot pink vestidos. 
They sway under El Sol whole bunches and unfurl their fiesta frills from June to September. We watch their salsas, their boleros, their chachas. Mira, my aunt shouts every time we pass. And every time we pass, they bob and curtsy. They twirl their sizzling fringe. This was my introduction to passion. Flowers, the way they explode into curls of crepe. And my aunt, the way she soul sings the old canciones right through drought, through these long tangled days after the accident, sometimes through clenched teeth. This is what I knew of spirit, espiritu, that molten stream, before I ever wrote a poem, before it turned me inside out like the blossoms. Beautiful. Thanks. It's so, so fun when... to read poetry. Yeah. For... <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, well, it's so fun to get to do poetry and talk about poetry a little, um, since it's kind of a former life, but I want to, if I write a verse novel, I feel like I'm melding my two, my two loves together. I, yeah. What can we expect on the on the front burner? Ah, well, the next book that's already under contract um, is another middle grade novel, and the main character is um, born in Guatemala, but she was adopted to the United States as a baby. And this was very common in real life, especially in the early 2000s. Um, and they have, the her birth family, or her adoptive family has located the birth mother. And so, um, you know, page one, they're learning about who this woman is. And our character, uh, Ara is her name right now. <laughs> um, Ara Elena, she's having mixed feelings about uh, what it's what it's going to mean and what she'll find out about herself if she can meet this this birth mom so they're they're going to Guatemala so this will be the first book that is taking place largely in in country <laughs> and um they'll meet the mom and there's also um a uh, ecological disaster that our main character needs to help avert so that'll give a nice, you know, some some drama and some work, you know, for her to do and a contribution to make. But the emotional journey is is really all about discovering her identity. And, you know, she's kind of built up a, a fairly Americanized identity, but now she's going to be somewhat similar to my other characters, you know, incorporating the Guatemalan part of herself and learning, you know, what it means to be Guatemalan after having worked so hard to be so American. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's coming. Yeah. What else is and coming? I'll go ahead and say to adding on to that, that um, a lot of adoptions in those years were uh, questionable. Um, some were totally legitimate and that's great, but Guatemala had so many uh, adoptions that really amounted to trafficking uh you know lawyers would tell parents and not just in the united states but other places uh that there was a baby and they would get quite a bit of money to facilitate the babies being sent to the these parents and um sometimes the women did not sign over custody they did not give up their child the child was taken or disappeared or um, yeah. you know, women were told their baby had died and the child did not die. And, um, I've actually met, uh, well, interviewed, uh, online, a couple of adopted adoptees <laughs> who were born in Guatemala. And there's a whole group of Guatemalan adoptees who are trying to discover their roots. And the way I met them is that they used one of my books for their book club <laughs> one time and they let me know. And, it turns out that um, their their stories are quite poignant because they they're trying to discover who their real parents are and and using searchers and and researchers uh, to do that and some of them have actually discovered their birth families uh, 
and in many, many cases, the, the family, the mother uh, was somehow tricked or, or forced or intimidated into letting go her child. So oh, wow. that's it's, super sad. It is. And the United Nations actually got involved in Guatemala ceased adoptions, I think in 2007, because this was so, such a problem. And my sister actually has witnessed some of the reunions between the birth and adopted folks. And um, uh, her dear friend is actually one of the researchers who helps families find each other. And so I thought, okay, there's my next book <laughs> right there. So yes, so that's How coming. devastating for the adoptive families also. Oh, it's so fraught because there's no way to re- capture those years, you know, for either the child or the family, the, the, it's just, uh, it's so tough. I, the, the woman I interviewed said that she has had a good experience with it, but, you know, um, she has no choice but to just kind of make the best of, of a stolen childhood and a, I don't know, uh, not that her life in the United States was bad. It was very stable. You know, she didn't go hungry. Um, but she also grew up in a very uh, kind of monocultural neighborhood in the Northeast and she was brown and she, you know, was made fun of. She, she did get bullied for her skin color. Um, and, you know, had she grown up in Guatemala, presumably that wouldn't have happened. I mean, other, not that she wouldn't have had other troubles or whatever, but um, ah, it's just very emotionally difficult. Um, but a lot of the families have, have made a very productive situation out of it. Um, my sister tells me that some families, some of the American families, will start sending money to the birth family and, and help each other and, and visit and like kind of form a super family. Um, and I don't want to imply that all Guatemalans are poor either. Hello. No, uh, you know, obviously uh, there's, there's a middle class, there's a rich class in Guatemala also, but a lot of the women who found themselves in these weird legal situations or, or, you know, victimized in this way were of lower means, you know, and had no way to, to get their children back. So, um, so another tough topic, I guess, uh, to address in middle grade, but, um, and I think one. I've never, I've never read so. of it before. So it'll be yeah. interesting. I yeah. I'm so. looking forward to it. Good. 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 <laughs> what would you tell your 10 year old self? Ooh, oh gosh. Okay. Well, first I'd have to tell her, you know, get off the swing because I spent a lot of time on the backyard swing. <laughs> um, and let me have a talk with you. I guess I would, you know, I would, I would really encourage her to um, not be afraid of being her full self. I think a lot of us, and at least I, you know, when I go into a situation, I tend to want to present the side of myself that that's comfortable for that environment. And then over here, I can switch and be this other person. But then it's tiring to be all these multiple people. Um, I would tell her, be all yourself in all the places, you know, be Hispanic with your Anglo family, be Anglo with your Hispanic family, like it's okay. Um, and also, um, go ahead and embrace your creativity too. Don't let that just um, die. Don't worry if people like what you're doing or don't, if you're getting encouragement or not, just do it for its own sake, you know, do it for the joy, mm -hmm. write the poems, write the stories, do little plays with your figures or your dolls or your, you know, sticks or whatever. Yeah. Keep doing that. Um, I was putting on plays with my best friend when I was that age and, um, and, you know, I stopped. I, it, it's kind of like with art, you know, you think you're a kid and you play with paints and crayons and clay and, and then as an adult, you say, oh, I can't do that. And why? Just keep playing, keep playing and, and be good to yourself. And yeah, shine. <laughs> that's, that's what I would tell her. What would you tell budding authors? Oh, gosh. I 
you know, read. Number one, read. <laughs> because I think I really learned about what story is. Like, what's the architecture of a story? I learned that from reading or hearing storytellers. Oral storytelling also is great. You know, if you have someone in your family who, who tells stories like my dad did all the time. Uh, yeah, listen, listen and read. Um, vocabulary, sentence structure, you can just absorb that from reading, 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 reading. What language is capable of? This is something you learn from watching the greats. You know, you can apprentice yourself to any of the great authors. Um, and in, in middle grade, I mean, that might be Kate DiCamillo or, or Aaron and Trotta Kelly or something. And if you're, you know, Shakespeare, why not? You know, apprentice yourself to these people by reading. But also then um, show your work to someone. You know, we, we, we're putting our souls into the work, you know, it's on the page and it feels very, we're exposed, we're vulnerable, but find a trusted person to share with and, and then try to develop a, a bit of armor around yourself so that you, you got to protect that creative self. And at the same time, you want to know how does it play out there? You know, there's no way to know if your words are going to reach another person without another person. So get over the fear of, of sharing and uh, and share with a trusted reader first. And don't be in a hurry to publish. That's, you know, that's waiting out there. Um, but if you want to publish, get educated about what it all means. Um, you know, self-publishing is real popular these days because it's so easy. But I have a lot of students who have come back to me and said, you know, I, I did self-publish my novel, my picture book. And now I realize I wish I had just waited and, and gone the traditional route because for me, that's what I want. You know, I want to be on the shelf at the bookstore. So for that, you, you pretty much have to go traditional. Um, not that there's anything wrong with self-publishing, but know what you're getting into, you know, educate yourself. It's very easy to Google all of this and find authors talking about it, find writing groups, um, you know, let writing groups are a whole subject, but uh, but join a group of other writers, people you respect, whose work you respect, learn all you can from them. Don't do every suggestion they say, you know, have some boundaries for yourself, you know, but yeah, show your work, read. Um, and when the time comes to publish, educate yourself so that you don't get scammed. Yeah. There's a lot of great resources out there. If you're writing for children, it's uh, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. But if you're writing romance or horror or whatever, there's people out there to, to help you with it too. Yeah. And, you know, most importantly, tell your story because we all have a story to tell. And only you, there's only one of you, you know, ever in the history of everything. Um like even if you were to reincarnate, it wouldn't be exactly like this. <laughs> so you you should bring your authentic self to the page and tell it. We need it. Yeah. What is on your professional and personal bucket lists? Oh, oh wow. So um I, you know, writing a book was on my bucket list, like having a book published. <laughs> and when it came to writing another book, I thought, oh, oh, wow, I guess I need to like make my goals. I need to redo this bucket list, right? <laughs> so now, I, you know, it's not really to to win awards and prizes, but it's just to to more and more put out books that, um, that, that speak to kids that's that and that celebrate that light I think is inside every one of us I I just want to do some good in this world while I'm here and I think writing turns out to be one of the main ways I can do that so I I I used to have particular things like I've just got to win the Newberry or something now I've actually been the judge for some national contests and things and I realize how um Gosh, yeah, how slippery that is as a goal. I mean, it's 
I love the Newberry and I love all the books, um, but all the runners up are pretty awesome too. Like there's just no way to, um, I, I don't want to let other people decide whether I'm a success. I want to, I want to have my own goals up just, which is just to write the stories that, that uh, I hope will, you know, help kids and make the world better. Um, personally, gosh, yeah, you know, I, I still have some travel goals. Um, last summer I walked 500 miles in Spain and oh, wow. I'd kind of like to do that again. <laughs> yeah. It's called the Camino de Santiago and it's a medieval pilgrimage route from the border of France in the Pyrenees mountains, all across Northern Spain through Burgos and Leon and earlier Pamplona. And you get to Santiago de Compostela and it's almost at the Atlantic ocean. And, um, I walked, it took me about a month and a little more to, to walk all the way. Uh, and so, and then now this summer I'm going to walk from London to Canterbury, which is a famous route taken by the pilgrims in the Canterbury tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, which is sort of a British literature staple. <laughs> if anyone's had to take route. It is only like 150 miles or so. So it'll take like two weeks. Um, yeah, something like that. And and I'll go a little slower this time, like some shorter distances. It sort of depends where the towns happen to be and, you know, whether you can stop yet or not. And so I like these long walks. I'd like to do some other long walks, um, maybe walk to Rome or Assisi from from somewhere in Italy. So, so that's on my personal bucket list. Yeah. Sounds fun. Yeah. Hard, but fun. Hard, but fun. Yeah. It's nice to see a country at the pace of walking, even our own country, you know, like just walking. I, I just like walking. And I also think differently when I'm walking, I have ideas when I'm walking. Maybe it's the rhythm of I don't know. It's, it's, yeah. So I like the the experience of walking and the the pace of it. Do you? Tend I need to that. You stay in inns or something. Yes, you can stay in inns and little bed and breakfasts in England. Now in Spain, they actually have little hostels all over the place. They call them albergues, which is the French word. But um, so they have really dorm type facilities or they'll convert a school or something sometimes they've converted a monastery or something and um you sleep on a bunk bed and it's like six euros a night and super cheap but if you want to pay more you can and stay in a little nicer one a little smaller one in england they don't have those so it's going to be more traditional bed and breakfast a lot more expensive but um i'll get to see england you know on foot and and really examine the leaves and the soil and the rocks, you know, as I'm going what by. What time of year would you do it? It'll be ma mainly June this time. So since I teach, I have to wait till I'm on vacation from teaching. Um, so, so summers. That, what is summer there? What, what temperature is it there? It's hot. I mean, England's at about the latitude of New York City. So it's kind of pretty nice like cooler than texas it'll be like 60 degrees or something in june 60 to 70 oh, nice. in the highs you know spain is a little further south so it's a little warmer in fact july in spain is downright hot but hey i'm coming from texas let me tell you it's not hot 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 <laughs> <laughs> like i know hot <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's great is there yeah. anything we missed gosh I feel like we really covered a lot and you have great questions. Thank you for, Thank you. you know, delving so deeply with me. It's, it's been really fun. Where can people find you? Ah, RebeccaBalcarcel.com is my website. Probably Googling um, the title of a book is easier. <laughs> so the other half of happy year. Um, but I, I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn, Facebook, and some sometimes other social media, but those are the main ones. So I am definitely findable. And there's a 
form on my website that'll let you, you know, anyone send me a message and I actually read them. So feel free to reach out and, you know, ask a question or. And there'll be a profile of Rebecca's work on my website, which is www.mindfulhappykids.com. And I will put a review of your new book when it comes out up. Yes, thank so you. So that we can, so we can, we're looking forward to reading that. And we're looking forward to reading a novel in verse that you write. Yes. I'm going to hold that's... you to that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that should be on the bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> write a novel in verse. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Oh, okay. okay. Awesome. Do, 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 do.